"'My dear parents,' said the sister, banging her hand on the table by way of an introduction, "'things cannot go on any longer in this way. Maybe if you don't understand that, well, I do. I will not utter my brother's name in front of this monster, and thus I say only that we must try to get rid of it. We have tried what is humanly possible to take care of it and to be patient. I believe that no one can criticize us in the slightest.' "'She is right in a thousand ways,' said the father to himself. The mother, who was still incapable of breathing properly, began to cough numbly with her hand held up over her mouth and a manic expression in her eyes. The sister hurried over to her mother and held her forehead. The sister's words seemed to have led the father to certain reflections. He sat upright, played with his uniform hat among the plates, which still lay on the table from the lodger's evening meal, and looked now and then at the motionless Gregor. "'We must try to get rid of it,' the sister now said decisively to the father, for the mother, in her coughing fit, was not listening to anything. "'It is killing you both. I see it coming. When people have to work as hard as we all do, they cannot also tolerate this endless torment at home. I just can't go on any more.' And she broke out into such a crying fit that her tears flowed out down onto her mother's face. She wiped them off her mother with mechanical motions of her hands. "'Child!' said the father sympathetically and with obvious appreciation. Then what should we do? The sister only shrugged her shoulders as a sign of the perplexity which, in contrast to her previous confidence, had come over her while she was crying. If only he understood us, said the father in a semi-questioning tone. The sister, in the midst of her sobbing, shook her hand energetically as a sign that there was no point thinking of that. If he only understood us, repeated the father, and by shutting his eyes he absorbed the sister's conviction of the impossibility of this point. Then perhaps some compromise would be possible with him, but as it is... "'It must be gotten rid of,' cried the sister. "'That is the only way, father. You must try to get rid of the idea that this is Gregor. The fact that we have believed for so long, that is truly our real misfortune. But how can it be Gregor?' If it were Gregor, he would have long ago realized that a communal life among human beings is not possible with such an animal, and would have gone away voluntarily. Then we would not have a brother, but we could go on living and honor his memory. But this animal plagues us. It drives away the lodgers, will obviously take over the entire apartment, and leave us to spend the night in the alley. Just look, father, she suddenly cried out. He's already starting up again. With a fright which was totally incomprehensible to Gregor, the sister even left the mother, pushed herself away from her chair, as if she would sooner sacrifice her mother than remain in Gregor's vicinity, and rushed behind her father, who, excited merely by her behavior, also stood up and half raised his arms in front of the sister as though to protect her. But Gregor did not have any notion of wishing to create problems for anyone, and certainly not for his sister. He had just started to turn himself around in order to creep back into his room, quite a startling sight since, as a result of his suffering condition, he had to guide himself through the difficulty of turning around with his head, in this process lifting and banging it against the floor several times. He paused and looked around. His good intentions seemed to have been recognized. The fright had lasted only for a moment. Now they looked at him in silence and sorrow. His mother lay in her chair with her legs stretched out and pressed together. Her eyes were almost shut from weariness. The father and sister sat next to one another. The sister had set her hands around the father's neck. "'Now perhaps I can actually turn myself around,' thought Gregor, and began the task again. He couldn't stop puffing at the effort, and had to rest now and then. Besides, no one was urging him on. It was all left to him on his own. When he had completed turning around, he immediately began to wander straight back. He was astonished at the great distance which separated him from his room, and did not understand in the least how, in his weakness, he had covered the same distance a short time before, almost without noticing it. Constantly intent only on creeping along quickly, he hardly paid any attention to the fact that no word or cry from his family interrupted him. Only when he was already in the door did he turn his head, not completely because he felt his neck growing stiff. At any rate, he still saw that behind him nothing had changed. Only the sister was standing up. His last glimpse brushed over the mother, who was now completely asleep. Hardly was he inside his room when the door was pushed shut very quickly, bolted fast, and barred. 
Gregor was startled by the sudden commotion behind him, so much so that his little limbs bent double under him. It was his sister who had been in such a hurry. She had stood up right away, had waited, and had then sprung forward nimbly. Gregor had not heard anything of her approach. She cried out, Finally! to her parents as she turned the key in the lock. "'What now?' Gregor asked himself, and looked around him in the darkness. He soon made the discovery that he could no longer move at all. He was not surprised at that. On the contrary, it struck him as unnatural that up to this point he had really been able up to move around with these thin little legs. Besides, he felt relatively content. True, he had pains throughout his entire body, but it seemed to him that they were gradually becoming weaker and weaker, and would finally go away completely. The rotten apple in his back and the inflamed surrounding area, entirely covered with white dust, he hardly noticed. He remembered his family with deep feelings of love. In this business, his own thought that he had to disappear was, if possible, even more decisive than his sister's. He remained in this state of empty and peaceful reflection until the tower clock struck three o'clock in the morning. From the window he witnessed the beginning of the general dawning outside. Then, without willing it, his head sank all the way down, and from his nostrils flowed out weakly his last breath. Early in the morning the cleaning woman came. In her sheer energy and haste she banged all the doors, in precisely the way people had already asked her to avoid so much so that once she arrived a quiet sleep was no longer possible anywhere in the entire apartment. In her customarily brief visit to Gregor she at first found nothing special. She thought he lay so immobile there because he wanted to play the offended party. She gave him credit for as complete an understanding as possible. Since she happened to be holding the long broom in her hand, she tried to tickle Gregor with it from the door. When that was quite unsuccessful she became irritated and poked Gregor a little, and only when she had shoved him from his place without any resistance did she become attentive. When she quickly realized the true state of affairs, her eyes grew large. She whistled to herself. However, she didn't restrain herself for long. She pulled open the door of the bedroom and yelled in a loud voice into the darkness, "'Come and look! It's kicked the bucket! It's lying there, totally snuffed!' The Samsa married couple sat upright in their marriage bed and had to get over their fright at the cleaning woman before they managed to grasp her message. But then Mr. and Mrs. Samsa climbed very quickly out of bed, one on either side. Mr. Samsa threw the bedspread over his shoulders. Mrs. Samsa came out only in her nightshirt, and like this they stepped into Gregor's room. Meanwhile, the door of the living room, in which Greta had slept since the lodgers had arrived on the scene, had also opened. She was fully clothed, as if she had not slept at all. Her white face also seemed to indicate that. "'Dead?' said Mrs. Samsa, and looked questioningly at the cleaning woman, although she could check everything on her own and even understand without a check. "'I should say so,' said the cleaning woman, and, by way of proof, poked Gregor's body with the broom a considerable distance more to the side. Mrs. Samsa made a movement as if she wished to restrain the broom, but didn't do it. "'Well,' said Mr. Samsa, now we can give thanks to God. He crossed himself, and the three women followed his example. Greta, who did not take her eyes off the corpse, said, Look how thin he was. He had eaten nothing for such a long time. The meals which came in here came out again exactly the same. In fact, Gregor's body was completely flat and dry. That was apparent really for the first time, now that he was no longer raised on his small limbs and nothing else distracted one's gaze. "'Greta, come into us for a moment,' said Mrs. Samsa with a melancholy smile, and Greta went, not without looking back at the corpse, behind her parents into the bedroom. The cleaning woman shut the door and opened the window wide. In spite of the early morning, the fresh air was partly tinged with warmth. It was already the end of March. The three lodgers stepped out of their room and looked around for their breakfast, astonished that they had been forgotten. "'Where is the breakfast?' asked the middle one of the gentlemen grumpily to the cleaning woman. However, she laid her finger to her lips and then quickly and silently indicated to the lodgers that they could come into Gregor's room. So they came and stood in the room, which was already quite bright, around Gregor's corpse, their hands in the pockets of their somewhat worn jackets. Then the door of the bedroom opened and Mr. Samsa appeared in his uniform, with his wife on one arm and his daughter on the other. All were a little tear-stained. Now and then Greta pressed her face onto her father's arm. "'Get out of my apartment immediately,' said Mr. Samsa, and pulled open the door without letting go of the women. 
"'What do you mean?' said the middle lodger, somewhat dismayed and with a sugary smile. The two others kept their hands behind them and constantly rubbed them against each other, as if in joyful anticipation of a great squabble which must end up in their favor. "'I mean exactly what I say,' replied Mr. Samsa, and went directly with his two female companions up to the lodger. The latter at first stood there motionless and looked at the floor, as if matters were arranging themselves in a new way in his head. "'All right, then we'll go,' he said, and looked up at Mr. Samsa, as if, suddenly overcome by humility, he was asking fresh permission for this decision. Mr. Samsa merely nodded to him repeatedly with his eyes open wide." Following that, the lodger actually went with long strides immediately out into the hall. His two friends had already been listening for a while with their hands quite still, and now they hopped smartly after him, as if afraid that Mr. Samsa could step into the hall ahead of them and disturb their reunion with their leader. In the hall, all three of them took their hats from the coat rack, pulled their canes from the cane holder, bowed silently, and left the apartment. In what turned out to be an entirely groundless mistrust, Mr. Samsa stepped with the two women out onto the landing, leaned against the railing, and looked over as the three lodgers slowly but steadily made their way down the long staircase, disappeared on each floor in a certain turn of the stairwell, and in a few seconds came out again. The deeper they proceeded, the more the Samsa family lost interest in them, and when a butcher with a tray on his head come to meet them, and then, with a proud bearing, ascended the stairs high above them, Mr. Samsa together with the women, left the banister, and they all returned, as if relieved, back into their apartment. They decided to pass that day resting and going for a stroll. Not only had they earned this break from work, but there was no question that they really needed it. And so they sat down at the table and wrote three letters of apology. Mr. Samsa to his supervisor, Mrs. Samsa to her client, and Greta to her proprietor. During the writing, the cleaning woman came in to say that she was going off, for her morning work was finished. The three people writing at first merely nodded, without glancing up. Only when the cleaning woman was still unwilling to depart did they look up angrily. "'Well?' asked Mr. Samsa. The cleaning woman stood smiling in the doorway, as if she had a great stroke of luck to report to the family, but would only do it if she was asked directly." The almost upright small ostrich feather in her hat, which had irritated Mr. Samsa during her entire service, swayed lightly in all directions. "'All right, then, what do you really want?' asked Mrs. Samsa, whom the cleaning lady still usually respected. "'Well,' answered the cleaning woman, smiling so happily she couldn't go on speaking right away, "'about how that rubbish from the next room should be thrown out, you mustn't worry about it. It's all taken care of.' Mrs. Samsa and Greta bent down to their letters, as though they wanted to go on writing. Mr. Samsa, who noticed that the cleaning woman wanted to start describing everything in detail, decisively prevented her with an outstretched hand. But since she was not allowed to explain, she remembered the great hurry she was in, and called out, clearly insulted, "'Bye-bye, everyone!' turned around furiously, and left the apartment with a fearful slamming of the door." "'This evening she'll be let go,' said Mr. Samsa, but he got no answer from either his wife or from his daughter, because the cleaning woman seemed to have upset once again the tranquillity they had just attained. They got up, went to the window, and remained there, with their arms about each other. Mr. Samsa turned around in his chair in their direction and observed them quietly for a while. Then he called out, "'All right, come here, then. Let's finally get rid of old things, and have a little consideration for me.' The women attended to him at once. They rushed to him, caressed him, and quickly ended their letters. Then all three left the apartment together, something they had not done for months now, and took the electric tram into the open air outside the city. The car in which they were sitting by themselves was totally engulfed by the warm sun. Leaning back comfortably in their seats, they talked to each other about future prospects, and they discovered that, on closer observation, these were not at all bad for the three of them had employment, about which they had not really questioned each other at all, which was extremely favorable and with especially promising prospects. The greatest improvement in their situation at this moment, of course, had to come from a change of dwelling. Now they wanted to rent an apartment smaller and cheaper, but better situated and generally more practical than the present one, which Gregor had found. While they amused themselves in this way, it struck Mr. and Mrs. Samsa, almost at the same moment, how their daughter— who was getting more animated all the time, had blossomed recently, in spite of all the troubles which had made her cheeks pale, into a beautiful and voluptuous young woman. 
Growing more silent and almost unconsciously understanding each other in their glances, they thought that the time was now at hand to seek out a good honest man for her. And it was something of a confirmation of their new dreams and good intentions when, at the end of their journey, their daughter got up first and stretched her young body. End of The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka Translated by Ian Johnston